Okay, <laughs> welcome again. I'm Chloe, um, I'm from Regen, sorry, we just had everything muted, so you weren't able to hear what we were saying. But anyway, uh, it's given time for a few more people to uh, turn up, we're nearly full. Um, so uh, we're here at the Regen offices, and I'm joined by Matt from WPD, Jerry and Bill from Wren, and I'm going to ask Bill just to pop his head over my shoulder so you can see his face. Uh, hello everyone, sorry about that, I hadn't clicked the button to take this off the mute, <laughs> completely my fault. I'm going to be here behind the scenes answering some of the questions that are coming. Thank you. Great. So my role is um, as the producer, so I'll probably you won't see much more of me either. I'm going to be um, turning cameras on and turning them off. You'll see mostly um, Matt, Jerry, and my colleague Tamar, who's also going to be talking through some of the analysis that we've had for this webinar. But before we get into it, while we're waiting for more people to arrive, um, I'm just going to talk through some admin. Um, so on your screen, on the right, you should see a little hand sign. We're not actually going to be using the hand raising tool today, but just below that is the speech bubble. And if you have any questions during the webinar, then please add your questions into that. And we will do our best to respond. But we've only got an hour for the duration of this webinar. So um, I think that we will probably only get to respond to 12 or so questions in the entirety. But we will produce an FAQs that will distribute at the end. So hopefully we'll be able to answer everyone's questions anyway. Um, so how are we getting with numbers? Right, we're doing pretty well. More and more people um, joining us. Um, during the process of the, oh, actually, I need to mention, at the bottom of your screen, on the right-hand side, there should be a little toggle that allows you to put your screen into full screen mode. And apparently, that improves the webinar experience for you. Um, if you want to uh, get out of that, I believe that you just press escape or move your cursor to the top of the screen, and that should allow you to exit full screen mode. Um, and I hope you will enjoy our webinar today. Um, we're going to be running five polls throughout the webinar, and we're going to just kick you off with the first one. The first poll is, uh, what do you want to get from the webinar today? So, Ben, can you launch the webinar, please? Great, so we're live, and um, your options are how we ran the trial, uh, reducing constraints on the network, time of use, tariffs and smart meters, the role of community groups in innovation trials, and the outcome of the trial recommendations and next steps. Um, so what we've got is we've got around a 10 second delay between what we're saying and your responses. And at the moment, we're on 60% of the people who are participating in this webinar having responded. So we'll just give it a couple more minutes, uh, seconds even, um, before we close the poll and share some of the results. Right. Uh, if your option isn't available, um, then one of the things that you could do is to add your thoughts to the question bar. Um, it that will allow us to. Um, uh, keep a record of what people are hoping to get from this and also to respond in the FAQs afterwards if we haven't been able to do so. Right, okay, so we're at a pretty good percentage of having of responses, so we're going to close the poll now and we're going to share the results. There you go. So most people seem to be interested in the outcomes of the trial, which is great because we're going to be able to share that with you today. Um, now, we are at five minutes past two, so I think that we've probably got as many people joining us now as we're going to have. Um, so we're gonna launch a second poll. Um, just for your benefit, who else is in this virtual room with us? So, um, launching it now, we have five options. Uh, researchers, university, network operators, electricity suppliers, local authority, community energy groups, consultants, technology providers, providers, government, and off-chain. Um, and we are on about 35% response rate so far. So you should be able to get a sense in a few moments of who else is in the room. Um, if you are not represented in those groups, please do also uh, add a comment 
uh, in the question box so that we are able to keep that recorded. Okay, I'm going to close this now and I'm going to share the responses. That's not me, by the way. That's Matt. You just caught a glimpse of Matt as we were sharing it. Um, and now you can see the spread of who the other attendees are who are here. Um, right, I'm going to close that in a second. And Matt is going to give you an overview of the project and an outline of what we're going to talk about. Great. So, um, as I said, I'm Matt Watson from WPD. Um, I was the, effectively the, the project manager for the Sunshine Tariff from WPD's perspective, um, and I've been doing various different roles, uh, various different projects within the Future Networks team, looking at various different uh, innovative new solutions uh, to issues on our networks. Um, and one of my areas of focus is particularly demand side response, so the Sunshine Tariff fits quite well into that. Uh, so today we're going to have a quick, very quick overview of what we've been doing. Um, Again, we probably not, we're not going to be able to go into cover everything we've done, so um, just be aware that we do have full reports on what we've been doing on the Regen website and also on the uh, WPD Innovation website. Um, so we'll start with some presentations uh, covering sort of an overview, some recruitment, some of the analysis and the conclusions. As we go along between each of those sections, we'll take a few questions. So as you come up with ideas for questions, just jot them down and we'll kind of cover them. And then at the end, we'll try and cover some of the wider um, questions left over. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is kind of just have an overview of the context uh, for the project, so kind of more, why we did this, um, have a look at the, what the project aims were, and then kind of cover what we did. Hopefully I'll do all that in 10 minutes, so it'll be a little bit quick, but it should give you a kind of perspective as to what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. So the general background behind the Sunshine Tariff is uh, based around quite a changing set of demands on distribution networks. Um, as we've had this incredible push for renewables and, we've, um, and embedded generation, uh, we've seen the demands put on the distribution networks change quite significantly. And whilst traditionally we kind of mainly focus on our, our work as, as DNOs on meeting winter peaks, um, we now actually have quite a considerable amount of work um, around how we connect additional generation to our network and how we enable customers to export to the network in a cost-effective manner. Um, this um, diagram gives a quick, very quick overview of uh, kind of some of the key stats for our different license areas, um, showing sort of summer um, loading levels, winter loading levels, and as well the amount of generation we've got connected. And I think it's quite a nice overview just to show how, um, say in the southwest, we actually have more connected generation, significantly more connected generation than our predicted uh, minimum demand in summer is. And in fact, when we can take everything that's accepted and not yet connected, but um, is in the pipeline, we'd actually have more generation connected to our network than we would have demand uh, in the winter peak. So we've had this huge transformation in what we have to do, what, in how our network operates. Um, and with that comes significant challenges, uh, challenges as to how, how we can continue to offer connections uh, cheaply and efficiently. Um, to give a bit of context around the Sunshine Tariff project, it was focused on in Weybridge, which on this diagram is highlighted in red. Um, so this is down in Cornwall, um, which is a predominantly rural network, um, and therefore was, was designed for quite low demands. Um, this, is, this is a snapshot from our sort of um, constraint map that we have for our different areas. And because we've had such a huge amount of generation connected, we've, had, we've been able to connect loads and loads of generation. Our networks are now approaching some of their limits for what we can um, connect in sort of a traditional way. Um, and so this kind of shows the highlighted area, the highlighted lines are the lines which are constrained. And then you can see in that area, there are a significant amount. But as you can also see in that area, you can see a huge amount of various substations, which are solar farms, wind farms, just a huge amount of generation in that area. Um, within the, the Sunshine Tariff was based around uh, Wadebridge because of Wadebridge Renewable Energy Network, so REN. Um, so, so they're a local energy cooperative who have done a huge amount of different sort of energy measures for their community. Um, and Jerry will talk to you in a bit, in a bit more detail about that uh, later. Um, and basically they wanted to connect more generation to the network. Uh, they wanted to connect a solar farm and help them sort of translate some of those benefits to their community. Um, but that, as you could see from the previous slide, the um, the network was constrained, um, and therefore the cost of connecting would have made their project uh, prohibitively expensive. 
Now, WPD has already been doing some work on alternative connections in terms of ways and how we can improve connections to our network. So, whereas our sort of standard procedure is to look at worst case scenarios and basically allowing generators to run whenever they want, unconstrained, we've now done quite a lot of work to try and build on the flexibility within uh, generation on our network. So, allowing customers to connect quicker and easier, um, but to accept some constraint um, to offset that. So effectively allowing them to connect, but disconnecting them when the network might be stressed. And these range from very simple things, such as timed connections, where the way we manage that is just through a simple profile. So you are allowed, if you're in a heavily sort of um, solar-dominated network, you're allowed to export uh, during the evenings, but you're not allowed to export during midday, uh, sort of around midday in the summer. And that kind of goes right up to sort of active network management where we have a fully dynamic active system measuring different points on the network, measuring curtail, uh, constraints and then curtailing generators. Um, and the Sunshine Tariff looked to kind of use a hybrid of those things. So whilst those, those connections all look about the flexibility of generation, the Sunshine Tariff wanted to combine that with the potential flexibility around demand, and especially with the links that uh, REN had with their local community. Um, the aim was to kind of take that time connection as a base, as a quite simplistic connection agreement, and to add to it the ability to uh, generate during that constrained period. So between April and September, between 10 and 4, um, allowing people to generate if they could find in enough demand within the local network to offset it. So effectively within that network, there were constraints at the higher voltage network, so here was a 33 kV line. So if you could, below those networks, offset whatever you generate with demand, you could have no, no impact on that um, high voltage level. And we felt this was something you could really access and really um, engage with their local participants to try and allow them to, to connect when they don't have the flexibility that commercial generators might have in terms of location. Um, so we pulled together the Sunshine Tower of Trial to investigate this. Um, we started off with some uh, feasibility work to understand the value flows around this, to understand um, what could and couldn't be done in turn and what would be helpful to generators. Um, and then we followed that up with a uh, actual domestic demand side response trial. Um, so recruiting customers in Wagebridge and seeing whether they could shift um, energy. So. Uh, WPD was the project lead and the, the funder, and we were kind of interested in this kind of um, the network side of things. We also had REN, who were the local community group, who were the boots on the ground, um, people going talking to customers, looking after customers, doing that whole customer recruitment aspect of things. We had Regen, who looked after the kind of more day to day project management, and then we had Tempus, who um, a registered a licensed supplier who allowed us to kind of administer the tariff and actually provide a workable tariff rather than um, a sort of a workaround that. Um, so in practice, we aimed to recruit 240 customers in the Weybridge area, um, give them a static time of use tariff, so effectively give them a an off-peak rate in the middle of the day between 10 and 4, and that was five pence per kilowatt hour, and off and then to have a higher rate outside of that time at 18 pence per kilowatt hour. We wanted to keep a nice, simple structure that, that would allow customers to really understand what, what we're trying to do and uh, adapt to that. And we also aim to have several different levels of intervention, ranging from just the trial, so just the tariff, um, going all the way to full sort of um, load um, automation, so active switching within their homes. And that's to try and understand not only the kind of whether people are interested, but what interests them and how they can shift. Is, it, is, is one more effective than the other? Now, in practice, um, we had significant challenges along the way, as is the case with all innovation. Um, there are always things that come up and change. Um, we had challenges around the recruitment. Um, we did find it very difficult to recruit customers, and we ended up with 46 on the actual uh, tariff. We had, I think, 15 extra in the control group. Um, so that's quite a few less than we were originally aiming for, but you know that was part of the kind of challenges of this trial. We also had challenges around tech. So we had smart meters installed in all customer premises, um, and we just had a few issues with getting those installed in time, getting data back from them, um, and processing that. And then that then impacted our analysis, um, and we kind of how how we assess data had to change and move to a more sort of qualitative set of analysis to try and get the most out of what we've got. So despite all these challenges. I think we did deliver quite a significant amount of learning, um, and Jerry and Tamar will go into a bit 
more detail about what we've learned specifically. But I think we've learned about the sort of key enablers um, for domestic demand side response. We've learned about things like the importance of automation, as Tamer will come on to, and I think has really helped feed into kind of WPD's uh, general kind of perspective on domestic demand side response and how and whether that can be feasible and useful for um, us as a DNA. Right, so I think we're now ready for a few questions. Yes, we are. And the first question is, given the location, when, and the grid constraints, is this trial replicable? That's an interesting question. Um, with, when we designed the trial, I think we were, we, we, as with any trial, you're trying to balance um, giving it maximum chance of success, but also versus replicability. So we specifically chose the weight progeria because it had relevant constraints. We also chose it because it had rent, because it had this um, strong local community that could engage with customers. And that's actually something that we, as um, we'll come on to, is it was something that's very important as part of recruitment. I think we also were very, very careful to make sure that we designed the tariff in a way that it was realistic, so that we didn't design a tariff that um, you know, would recruit customers, but would actually never be replicable. So, you know, in terms of the effort that we put in, and the resource we put in, in terms of recruitment, in terms of, you know, what the tariff actually was, not over-subsidising, all this was really designed to make it as replicable as possible. Great. We've got a question from Louise. Um, do we need derogations from Ofgen to do this? So, in the way we did this here, no. Um, so this was all done... Um, through existing arrangements. Um, that, in part, was enabled by the fact that we had a supplier on board through Tempus, so they allowed us, they effectively administered the tariff. Um, as many of you might know, um, the kind of interaction between DNOs and suppliers is quite interesting. It's actually as part of the project, we um, did actually open up this kind of provision of the trial to all suppliers, um, because you know, that, that could be quite an interesting bit. But effectively, it was all done through um, through existing uh, trial, um, existing uh, codes and with the eggs and some new technology. I, mean, I think, yeah, it's all in terms of derogations. are fine. I think because it's some of the newer technology we're using, that then was some of the issues that we will sort of discuss later. Okay, thank you. Um, Richard says, what kind of technology was being switched? So um, it really depended on the uh, customer, and Tamar will go into loads more detail on this later, but um, depend so we had different levels of um, customers, some we just gave them the tariff and it was up to them to switch, um, so, and Tamer will present some results on what they think they switched, and then we also had some automation. Um, it tended to be the automation focused more on sort of larger appliances, so it was generally things like immersion heaters or electric vehicle charging, um, but again, I think Tamar will go into a bit more detail with that later. Great, thank you. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions about recruitment, and Jeremy's going to be talking about recruitment in a minute, so we're not going to answer those at the moment, but you should get them in the next section. Where we're at now is you're going to have another poll. Would you switch to a time of use tariff? And so I'm just launching that right now. Um, so obviously it's a yes, no, and a maybe. And I'm going to give you a few moments to respond to that while um, Jerry and Matt swap in the hot seat. So far we've had 53% of our attendees uh, who voted. So I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. Um, because I don't want anyone to be disappointed in not being able to vote. Um, right. Okay, we're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. There we go. Right. So, hello, Jerry. Um, I'm just going to share the results. Um, here we go. So, yes, 43% of people say yes, they would switch, and 50% of people say maybe. 7% definitely wouldn't. Um, was that what you found when you <laughs> when uh, speaking to the people of Weybridge? Hi, Joey. You're you're on screen now, so. Just trying to get the. Oh uh... uh, yeah. It's not going. Anyway, I'm Jerry Clark from Weybridge Renewable Energy Network. Hang on, just a second. We seem to have. We're just having a tiny mini glitch. 
just hiding the poll. We've got Jerry on screen. Um, and here we go. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Um, I'm Jerry from Weybridge Renewable Energy Network. Uh, Weybridge is a small town of less than 10,000 people um, on an estuary on the North Cornish coast uh, near Panstow and Poltech. Um, we were tasked with the um, uh, trying to, to recruit 240 customers to the uh, tariff um, from an area that was only just over 4,000 households. Uh, plus a control group from a, a, a closely adjacent area, so a fairly limited area to, to recruit from. Um, how we did it, uh, well, REN has over 1,200 members which have signed up with us for various reasons from just general health and energy issues to free insulation to um, help with finding a good supplier for solar PV, all sorts of things. But so uh, we have direct email access to 1,200 households, so that was a good starting point. Not all of them were in the Tupperware area, but they all got sent the email anyway. Um, local newspapers were very interested, TV and radio also uh, in the local area. I think there was even some national press. Um, we had postcode time to be fatigued by the Royal Mail on the main PL27 postcode, which was, is most of the time area. Um, displays and events in our own energy shop, and we also had um, leaflets in other local business and via doctor surgeries and local schools. Uh, so fairly wide coverage in, in terms of how we got the message out. Uh, right, a bit on who we recruited. Um, as Matt said, 46 households were recruited to the Sunshine Tariff itself, which is the dual tariff, uh, plus 15 others in the control group, which were on a flat tariff, which was kind of in between the, the 18p and the 5p, it was 13 pence. Uh, we had interest from over 200 households, uh, 380 inquiries, as obviously some of them focused more than once. Uh, 89 actually signed up, but 14 were rejected due to location. There's a little bit of a misunderstanding with regard to the the, um, the geography of the project, which is not, not that simple because it is connected to wires that aren't necessarily easy to see. Um, 14 more couldn't switch to Tempus for various technical reasons to do with um, supply, how suppliers work. Um, three quarters of the sign ups were REN members, which uh, shows the importance of the trusted uh, local organisation when trying to do something like this. Um, as you would imagine, a large portion were homeowners, 92% in this case, because uh, they obviously have more control over what goes on in their homes. 50% of occupants, this is occupants, not bill payers, were in the 36 to 65 age range, and 33% were under 18, so a lot of children in the households. 43% uh, of bill payers were employed, 24% were self employed, and 31% retired. So the 31% retired would, would more likely be at home during the day and probably quite a high proportion of the self-employed are working from home, so they may well be using power during the day. There was also one unemployed uh, sign-up. Um, around half the households over, had over £30,000 of annual income, so this isn't necessarily the top salary in the household, it's the total household income. And the average consumption of the participants was around 4,000 kilowatt hours a year, which is not far away from the national average. So this nice uh, graph with um, arrows all over it is showing you the uh, opposing forces, forces uh, helping with recruitment and those opposing it. Um, as you can see, the largest area there is, is REN being a trusted intermediary with existing relationships. That's um, where most of the sign-ups came from. Uh, the tariff incentives were seen as, as um, attractive, certainly at the outset. Um, we were able to get extensive publicity out, we had very good local networks. Uh, the novel approach of the uh, tariff was, was of interest to some people. Um, but against all that, we had uh, timescales reduced from what we intended to due to a slightly late start on the project. Um, which was quite a challenge, um, and halfway through the um, 
sign-up period, we've had some changes in the market conditions, which um, basically there are a lot of new players in the supply market that were offering very good tariffs, um, which made it difficult to sell one that was basically uh, not quite so attractive as it was when we started out. Uh, geographic restrictions I've already touched on was was an issue. We did have interest from outside, but it was uh, you know we were strict about where we got them from. Um, interest existing contract lock-ins were quite important, although there's a potential to save quite a lot of money on the tariff. Um, people didn't want to spend the money on buying out of their existing contract. We did a, a survey halfway through the uh, process, um, basically surveying men members that didn't sign up, or well, at least ones that were potentially able to sign up that were on the in the right area. Um, reasons given: this is in order of uh, popularity, um, economic. Uh, customers predicted the savings would not be made due to several factors, including having solar PV themselves, uh, being on economy seven because we couldn't support the dual tariff meter, although we were although we were offering a dual tariff that was based on the time rather than the meter actually switching. They found a better tariff, um, exit penalties which I've already mentioned, and they didn't see if they could shift enough power largely due to maybe being out of work. Um, other restrictions um, which may meant not all households could take part um, outside the target area, as we've mentioned. Key meters couldn't be supported, existing contracts again, and one or two said they were moving during that six month period. Um, fourth on the list is, is hassle. Uh, people perceived a need to switch suppliers again after the six month trial, although that wasn't necessarily going to have to happen. Um, a lack of understanding either of how the tariff worked or who Tempus Energy were. Um, and right at the bottom of the list was lack of interest and ran out of time to apply. I think there was just one or two in uh, responses in each of those categories. Right, key lessons learned. This is just with regard to um, uh, getting the sign ups. Uh, participant demographics. Um, it was interesting that the more affluent section of the population were more likely to sign up, which is possibly counterintuitive in as much as you think the people that needed to save money would be the ones that would be more likely to. Also, other, other, it was clear that what we term early adopters were quite large in, in the sign ups. Uh, REN members and those that have solar PV already, I think 36% of the participants actually had solar PV, which meant, meant it wasn't necessarily sensible for them to sign up to save money. Um, also interesting is a wide range of consumption levels, anywhere from 1,000 to 22,000 kilowatt-hours a year, and a wide range of main heating methods all the way from being on a gas main, which is many by um, in that area, there's quite a lot of off-gas off grid. And then so, so we go to uh, oil, color gas, logs, coal, electricity, all sorts of things. Um, the other main lessons were the time scales required. Um, basically, you needed an awful lot more than we had. We had about two months. Um, you needed uh, many more than that. Um, what would have kicked in, given a bit more time, would have been word of mouth, and also people's contracts coming to an end, so that that barrier wouldn't be there. Um, switching process needed uh, more time to overcome challenges, basically in terms of the supplier, um, the technical processes in, involved in switching people from other suppliers was more constant than, than they imagined. Um, and also more time is required to install and troubleshoot the meters. So, right, questions? so we've got to uh, questions uh, section. So if you do have another question, please do submit it in the questions box. Um, but Joey, if you were running the trial again, what would you do differently? Two main things. Um, I'd make sure that we had more time. I mean, the reason we the reason we did, we, we were thinking of maybe delaying it a year to give us more time, but the momentum would have been lost then, so I think uh, we had to go with what we did. 
But um, other than that, also having a dynamic tariff that could be adjusted to take account of market conditions would have been uh, quite helpful too. Okay, Kay is asked, um, if you had difficulty recruiting, why didn't you expand the uh, area that you were uh, recruiting from to the broader REM network? Um, I think this is based on how the project was set up. Um, it was based on people connected to a particular substation, so that we could monitor what's happening at the substation level. Um, so without redesigning the project, we couldn't really expand it. Okay, so um, Joe has asked, did you do any work to help potential customers work out when the tariff would be economically beneficial to them individually? Yes, we designed a little spreadsheet that we could put their existing usage in and um, calculate for them whether the tariff itself would help, but also we could, we could put parameters around how they use the house. Great, okay. Um, Jerry, thanks ever so much. Um, we are going to uh, finish the questions there, and um, we've had lots of other questions, um, but and we're going to try and respond to those. Um, uh, Bill is diligently typing away, responding to some of them. So in the meantime, we'll have, a, we'll have another poll. Um, so if you were to uh, switch or try and shift your energy, how much energy do you think you could shift? So we've just launched that poll and um, while we're waiting for the arrival of Tamar and um, I'm hoping that you can all take a moment to respond and let us know what you think. It's quite a challenging question, isn't it? Um, so, so far we have a 45% response rate from participants, so um, I'm just going to wait a few more moments to see whether we, anyone else wants to respond. Right, okay, so we're up to 70% of our participants have responded, so I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to share it immediately. And there you go, 15% of people think that they're going to be able to, to shift 0 to 5%, 42% think that they would be able to shift 6 to 10%, 32% think 11 to 20 and 10% think that they'd be able to shift 21 to 50%, but no one thinks that they could go above 51%. Um, do you think that's reflective, Tamar? Well, that, that is very interesting, and I will um, tell you more about what we found in the Sunshine Tariff trial. So, um, so I'm Tamar, I'm from Regen. Um, I manage Regen's work on smart grids and local supply. Um, I was responsible for the day-to-day -day project management of Sunshine Tariff trial, as well as the data analysis. So I'm going to talk through um, our sort of headline findings from the trial over the next five to ten minutes. Um, I should say up front that the findings are based on both the quantitative and qualitative um, data that we collected. Um, the quantitative data came from the smart meters and uh, measured the uh, household's consumption, electricity consumption, and the qualitative data came from um, an online survey that we carried out um, after the trial as, as well as 10 interviews. And before I share the findings, um, it's worth mentioning a few caveats. So, um, as Matt said, um, we had some technical problems with the smart meters, which meant that uh, we had to actually go around and manually download all the data from each household. Uh, so, this uh, was not only problematic, but also meant that the data set was not as complete as we'd hoped it was going to be. Um, and as Jerry talked about, we didn't get as many participants as we'd, as we'd hoped. Um, therefore, our sample size was much smaller. Um, so. This means that we're just going to describe the patterns that we saw in the data and not extrapolate our findings to other populations because we wouldn't be able to say with any confidence that you'd see the same results again. So starting with our headline finding, um, the participants on the Sunshine Tariff on average shifted 10% of their demand into the 10 to 4 period. Um, as shown on the chart there, the control group is in blue and the Sunshine Tariff customers are in orange. And you'll see that the Sunshine Tariff customers managed to reduce their morning peak and their evening peak considerably compared to the control and shifted that into the middle of the day. 
And bringing this back to um, the original uh, research question about whether we could offset the generation from a local solar farm, if we uh, imagined that there was a 250 kilowatt solar farm in the local area, and based on these findings, we'd need 650 Sunshine Tariff customers to offset that generation, which is about 20% of, of the homes in Wade, Wade Bridge, which is quite a lot. Another key finding uh, relates to the customers that had automation technology. So they were able to shift 13% of their consumption um, into the middle of the day compared to only 5% for those without automation technology. And by automation technology we mean, um, so a lot of the homes had hot water immersion systems that had a timer on that switched them automatically on. Um, and some of the other customers had um, automatic switches for their electric vehicles and other kind of large flexible loads. So um, if you look at the chart, uh, the control group is once again the light blue, um, the customers without um, automation technology is the dark blue line and those with automation technology is the green line and, and you'll see also that uh, the green line, uh, those with automation control technology um, have much higher um, higher demands throughout the day as well. <clears throat> and um, the interviews and the qualitative data backed up this findings. So when we asked customers how much they were able to change their electricity consumption, those with automation technology felt they were able to shift a lot and, and quite a lot more than those that, that um, didn't have the automation technology. And another question we asked them in the survey um, so we asked the customers without automation technology if they felt that having some smart switches would have helped them and 50% said yes, so that does indicate to us that there is some appetite um, for more automated control technology. Another key finding was that the high energy users were able to shift a much greater proportion of their consumption into the sunshine hours than the low and medium energy users as shown in that chart. Um, the low energy users shifted 6% of their, their average daily demand, uh, the medium energy users shifted 10% and obviously the high energy users 18%, so quite a significant difference there. Um, and this is mainly due to the large energy users having greater flexible loads, so um, those with hot water immersions and electric vehicles tended to fall into that category. Um, and obviously a lot of those had their, uh, automatic switches on, on those appliances as well. And when we asked customers about their experience of the Sunshine Tariff, their perception of how much they shifted was much greater than the smart meter data indicated. Um, this is partly due to the fact that we, because we didn't have the data, we weren't able to regularly feed back to the customers how much they were shifting. Um, but I think it's also to do with the types of appliances that customers were tending to switch. or shift, sorry. Um, so they tended to be washing machines and dishwashers. Um, but also uh, we've got their sort of hot water immersion, electric vehicle charging, electric heaters. Um, and under the other category, we had sort of vacuum cleaners, tumble dryers, um, lawn mowers. Uh, but as you can see from the chart, washing machines and dishwashers were the most, um, most used uh, appliances during that time. And if you look at how much uh, power on average those appliances use, it's actually relatively low compared to, say, um, the electric vehicle charging or hot water immersion systems. So I think that's why uh, people felt they were doing a lot more, um, mainly because of the effort that was required to, to change those consumption behaviours. Um, so overall, customers reported a positive experience of taking part in the trial. Um, there's a couple of quotes there from some of our happy customers. Um, and when we asked them if they would uh, switch to a time of use tariff again in the future, 73% said yes they would and only one customer said no they wouldn't. Um, and when we compare that with the customers with automation control technology, I think it was around 85% said they would switch to a time of use tariff again. Um, I don't have uh, time to go into much more detail now, but do download the um, findings report which are available on Regen's website and Western Power's innovation website uh, for more information. And I think we've got time for some questions now. We do, yes. And the first question is, uh, what could be done to increase the percentage of load shifted? Okay, so increasing um, the load shifted. I, 
obviously the, the key things that came out of the trial was that um, having some automation, so some smart switches, is really helpful, as well as having flexible load. That's a key thing. So being able to, um, yeah, to have those kind of large loads in the house that you can turn on at a different time is, is key. Um, but another aspect was that um, we were hoping to provide a lot more feedback to customers. So subgroup two, um, Matt talked about the original uh, groupings that we wanted to have. In subgroup two, we're going to have regular feedback from Ren. So on a fortnightly basis, where we're going to get an email or a phone call saying, this is how much you've managed to shift in the last couple of weeks, and have you tried doing this, and, or have you tried you know, changing behavior in this way? Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to test that because we didn't have the data, but um, that is something that could have helped. Sure, okay. Um, so we have a question from Tracy Kennedy. Do you believe this behavioural change is sustainable? That's a really good question. We did um, monitor uh, performance over time, so we wanted to see if um, at the beginning of the trial uh, people were much more active than towards the end of the trial. Um, but actually the data didn't indicate that. Um, we only saw a drop off uh, right at the end when we told customers that we were no longer, that, that the time of use tariff was no longer um, happening. So, uh, but, but performance during, over the period of the trial was pretty consistent. So obviously it's hard to tell um, if that was only a five month period. It's difficult to tell if, you know, over a year or two years where the customers would actually um, not change their behavior. But, um, but when I interviewed customers, lots of them said that once they'd established the habits, that it was actually very easy to maintain those habits. Okay, um, uh, we have a question from Daniel, who says, Ren's degree of embeddedness and position as a trusted local facilitator seemed important to bring about behaviour change on the part of customers. Is the scheme replicable in other areas without a similar community organisation? Could the DMO take on this role? Um, Matt's probably better placed to answer this question, um, but uh, in regards to uh, the role of REN in providing information, I think um, yeah, I think I think that um, it, it's, they have a very important role in kind of um, in education and uh, being available to customers to ask questions and ask about sort of to get tips from them. Um, and as I said, unfortunately, we didn't have that sort of regular feedback from them because we didn't have the data. But um, it would have been interesting to have seen if that played a, a greater role in in them being able to shift their consumption. Um, Paul's asked. Was there any sense from anyone that they didn't like their behaviour being monitored? Um, not at all. Um, we had one customer that dropped out just before we launched the tariff because they weren't happy about having a smart meter. Um, but I think the fact that Ren and Tempest were very open about, um, you know, we were upfront about the fact that everyone had to have a smart meter, that their data would be collected, and we were also clear that that data would be anonymized. So um, everything we received at Regen in terms of data was anonymized. Um, so I think people were generally quite happy with that, and I think everyone understood that because this was part of a trial, um, they were sort of you know, keen to be part of um, something new and exciting. Great. Okay, I'm going to switch off the video screen for a second while you and Matt swap places, and we're going to ask Matt to provide a little bit of conclusion and lesson learned. Um, hello again, Matt. Hi. Yeah, so as you kind of heard from Jerry and Tamar, there's been a lot that's kind of come out of this trial. We've learned a lot about kind of difficulties and the challenges around recruitment and kind of the, some of the pros and cons, but we've also learned quite a bit about how customers shift and what makes it easy. And it's interesting to kind of combine the sort of quality of data with the quantity of the kind of how people perceive things and what, what people are happy to do and kind of their opinions. So I think there's some really valuable stuff there. Um, in terms of general conclusions, I think I'm going to try and and break it down into sort of two areas. There's the kind of um, kind of the more kind of constrained um, sunshine tariff learning, so around the trial and kind of how we did that. But then I think there's also some much wider context um, domestic DSR kind of learning, learning that's kind of influencing wider kind of innovation work within WPD. So I think obviously the first piece of the first conclusion is just that customer recruitment is really difficult and really challenging. And I think that's especially so when you're looking to do it in a sustainable and scalable way. So we're very 
we're taking away start of the project, that we didn't over-resource or over-subsidize any of these tariffs. We wanted something that would be sustainable and that would could actually scale. Um, and within those parameters, it, it was very difficult to get customers uh, engaged. And once you have them engaged, it's very difficult to get customers to commit. Um, I think with that commitment, the, the local connection with Red was uh, absolutely uh, paramount. I think it was it, it, it enabled us to get that level of but it, it just it does show the kind of level of importance of that kind of local trusted party. I think once customers were recruited, we saw this kind of limited amount that domestic customers can shift, um, especially those from that automation. I think it shows that automation is absolutely key in terms of enabling uh, domestic flexibility. So I think that ties back again to the kind of whether this is sustainable. As you bring more more kind of automation in, then it becomes easier and easier for customers to participate. I think all this just kind of highlights that the, the, the domestic demand side response world isn't as mature as potentially expected when we started the trial. Um, and therefore, WP won't be rolling out an offset connection agreement because of the practical challenges around how that would actually work. However, I think it does feed into kind of our wider work on domestic demand side response. Um, interestingly, we just put out a paper fairly recently kind of summing up quite a few of our different projects, uh, the kind of general learning around this, um, and kind of some of our next steps as well. So if you're interested in that, please have a look at that on our innovation website. Um, I think one of the key things to remember is that domestic demand side response, so things like the Sunshine Tariff and several of the other trials that the DNOs have been doing, has to sit within the wider context of flexibility. Um, and that's within uh, network operators' requirements, but also within the wider industry requirements. We aren't the only people who are interested in flexibility. There are suppliers, there's a national grid, lots of people that would value flexibility. And it needs to sit within that market, and that includes you know, going up against industrial and commercial flexibility. As within each of those people who require um, flexibility, we all and then as a network operator, we have a requirement to do things in the most efficient and economic way uh, possible. Um, and that allows, means you know, creating markets for different flexibility to play, but then actually taking the most efficient and effective um, methods. I think another thing that we've learned is that, kind of this again comes back to one of the questions that the team asked was, is the, um, is the, the DNO probably isn't the best place to become a domestic aggregator. Um, uh, but we do see ourselves as a role in terms of developing these wider demand side response schemes and then allowing a level playing field for domestic uh, aggregators to participate. I think we very much feel that um, we don't have the, the customer relationships and that, and that local presence to be able to deliver the kind of support that is required for domestic aggregation. And there are other people within the industry, whether that be um, suppliers, aggregators, equipment manufacturers, there are huge amounts of people who could access that far more effectively than us. And I think our challenge is to create markets for flexibility and create products for flexibility that can be accessed by different players, whether that be an industrial customer turning down load or turning up load, or whether it be um, a third party who is controlling hundreds, if not thousands of domestic customers. I think the final bit is that uh, I think this has really helped us identify several key sort of market enablers and market changes that need to happen to make domestic demand side response viable and allows us to kind of um, check when we'll need to reevaluate the kind of fe feasibility of kind of doing things like the Sunshine Tariff. And I think fortunately quite a lot of this stuff is stuff that's already underway in the wider industry. So things like high penetration of smart meters and domestic half hourly settlements. You know, one of the significant, uh, you know, one of the challenges around the, around the trial was getting smart metering in, um, and one of the key ways of getting value out of the trial, as you can read in the feasibility report, is, a, is around that area of domestic car family settlement. So I think those are really, really key enablers to enable entire and use tariffs. I think there's a question about simpler and more efficient um, switching. So that came about as we had quite a few customers who were interested in the tariff but couldn't actually make the switch due to various different objections from previous suppliers. The other option within that is to have, is to allow, uh, is to kind of widen the kind of scope of these things and, and kind of be a, allow the, the network operators to procure from multiple different suppliers in areas. So go and recruit from existing supply bases to kind of avoid this having this well-known issue that is um, the difficulty around um, switching suppliers. Um, the other kind of view is, is that once you've done that, which kind of helps 
for kind of recruitment of customers, you then got this kind of question about how you get more shifting from customers. And I think that will come from various different things. It will come through increased automation, as we showed that as kind of a real key part. I think it will also come as we get new um, domestic flexible loads. Um, you know, some of the key things on the horizon are things like electric vehicles, uh, potentially domestic storage, there are new ways of heating, um, uh, heating houses and things. And I think all these things can allow um, people to kind of build more flexibility and hopefully then that can be harnessed and brought into some of the kind of schemes that allow um, network operators to access that flexibility and deliver value to our customers. Now, I think... Yeah, we um, before we go on to questions, because there are a number of questions that are for the full team, I'm going to launch another poll, um, and we'd like participants to let us know, please, uh, what would you like to know more about? Um, and I'll just give you a few moments while we um, shift some seats around, so the next view that you'll get of the team will be... Um, Everyone sitting in a row, more or less, <laughs> to answer some questions. But I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep this poll up for a second, and perhaps you can answer while we're waiting for responses. There have been a number of questions about the potential role of batteries to support this type of approach, both in the home and in the network. Can the team comment on this? I would say. Yeah, there is there's quite a bit of scope for batteries and things. I think that came to that last point about there being more domestic flexibility. As as flexibility is seen as more and more of an important commodity, I think it will be a bit designed to a lot, lot more systems. The storage will be one of those things that can participate in it. Um, but yeah, and I, but I think as, as a network operator, our view is very much about setting out requirements and then allowing the market to decide how best to uh, facilitate that, whether that be a domestic level storage, industrial scale storage, or actually industrial customers that can change the way they work. And just to add to that, um, we didn't. None of our customers had um, sort of standalone batteries in their properties. Um, however, we, we did have three customers with electric vehicles, um, and they were sort of in that large energy user bracket. They were able to shift a lot more of their load than than customers without. So yes, batteries would would really help customers with with any kind of time of use tariff. Okay, just before I go to the next question, I'm just going to close this poll and I'm going to share the results. Oh, there are your beautiful faces on screen for everyone to see for a moment. Uh, right, sharing the results from the previous question, just for people's interest. And we can see that um, there is really a quite a big interest in 60% of the uh, people listening want to know more about domestic demand side response and 59 want to know about innovation, innovative uh, connection agreements. So um, I'm going to ask a question from Kay. Um, did you feel that the participants really understood their energy use before participating in the trial? It varies from customer to customer. Some of them have very little understanding. Um, some others are very well. The 36% of the uh, trial households had PV of their own, and they're fairly uh, used to trying to use that um, in real time, so um, adding in the tariff just meant they had more to use during the day. But as I say, it varied enormously, and um, most of the customers we were able to educate further by giving them tips to start with as what things would be useful to do during the day, especially the, the people that are at home during the day could cook their main meal at lunchtime, probably what to do anyway, that's very traditionally informal, and um, yeah, things like that really. Um, so it varies, basically. Right, and for the last question of the day, I'm going to hand over to Bill. Hi, there's been a number of questions through, asking questions about the um, the economics of this approach, whether the cost savings for the individuals in the home make sense, whether the economics for an energy supply would make sense. So I know that's quite a broad topic, but could you add a few more details on the economics of this approach? Um, so, if you're interested in uh, sort of whether a time of use tariff of this kind stacks up, um, have a look at the feasibility study um, that's being published on our website and on the Western Power Innovation website. Um, we and before we even launched the time of use tariff um, in Weybridge, we looked at whether um, it was actually feasible to run this kind of um, 
tariff in current markets and also whether you know the future markets would enable this to happen and uh, the outcome of that study was that um, time of use tariffs already exist and they tend to be based on um, uh, the supplier benefiting from having lower wholesale energy costs at um, off-peak times as well as lower use of system charges at off-peak times so um, yeah we decided that uh, or, or found out that uh, that type of time of use tariff was already feasible and economic in current markets and in future markets will become even more so as, as um, the things that Matt talked about sort of evolve and develop. I think we also, we also part of that feasibility, we also looked at the how much a generator, so all this is based around generation connections as the kind of main, and we looked at kind of how much they could subsidise um, and if, I think it was, it was some, but not a huge amount, especially if you're looking at this as an enduring solution. I think the details are in the feasibility report. I mean, we'll, I mean there are various different strands of value. It's from the generated stuff to the supplier. Um, so looking at kind of the value of new customer suppliers and trying to build this kind of um, framework. I think with all this, it kind of ties into some of the wider work that's around the industry about how you um, deliver maximum value from flexibility, how you generate value from different pots to kind of make something that actually works for multiple people. So stuff, if you can generate value from the DNO, from the supplier, multiple people, then you can actually deliver a far better and more efficient product to customers. I just add one thing to that, is that the, the capacity for a generator to subsidise that to a degree was based on tariffs as they were while we designed the uh, project. Um, obviously, most of you know that uh, most of those tariffs have been much reduced since then, so that capacity probably isn't there now. Great. Okay. Well, um, I just want to say thank you all to the team for um, sharing your experience on this trial, and I want to say thank you all to the participants who uh, part um, have joined us on this webinar. Thank you very much for giving us your views, and I hope you'll give us some more of your views in the survey that launches immediately after you, after the webinar ends. Um, if you do want to find out more, um, then we will be sending a copy of the summary report to everyone who came along. And if you'd like to speak to someone in the team, then please do consider coming along to Region Smart Energy Marketplace, and you can see on your screen some details for that. Um, as we finish the webinar, um, so, Bill wants to add something. A number of people have asked for copies of slides and or a recording, so we will come sure that that can happen as well. Absolutely, um, yes, um, we, we will send out details of that, um, but please also feel free to go to any of our websites, the WPD Innovation website, regionsouthwest.co.uk, and REN's website as well. www.renwren.uk.com Okay, so um, we'll send out details of all of those websites as well. Um, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you at another webinar again in the future. Thank you very much.